But the three men uh, were born into slavery, survived slavery, and uh, thrived as they came to Melbourne after slavery and uh, homesteaded here in the Melbourne area. As you know, Peter Wright and Wright Brothers certainly uh, took advantage of the Homestead Act in the 1860s. Uh, I don't know about Bailey Allen, he's kind of a man of mystery. He died very early in Melbourne's history. I don't, have not been able to find anything that he took advantage of the Homestead Act. Um, I did find an old map that does show his name uh, south of Crane Creek on the riverside. And Wright Brothers settled for today's video discussion. It'll be on the west side of today's US-1 over in that area. And that's really where we're going to focus today. And of course, Peter Wright, north side of Crane Creek. And you can look his story up. But uh, not, not sure about Balaam Allen as far as him and taking advantage of the Homestead Act. And one other thing on the Homestead Act, um, you were granted up to 150 acres, but you had to cultivate it and uh, in order to, uh, to have it for free. Um, but if you settle on a thoroughfare, I guess that's the right term, basically in this case the waterway where there was transportation, uh, which was the transportation at that time, uh, it was cut in half to 75 acres. So uh, I'm pretty sure that's what Peter Wright ended up taking was 75 acres. And apparently Wright Brothers less than that. But uh, anyway, that was kind of the rule in the Homestead Act. But up along as uh, Prospect turns into Lipscomb, south of Crane Creek was the brother's property where he had fruit trees. He grew citrus and sold that. That's how he really made his living. Um, there's still brother's family on the property, which is a, which is a neat thing So uh, as of today. Uh, but anyway, uh, the Allen Chapel AME Church was founded on the brother's property. Um, there's a house here I'll, I'm showing in the video, a photo of it that uh, certainly was part of the brother's family in some way or another. It was right on the property. Um, there's some speculation on who actually lived there. Um, not exactly sure, but uh, certainly the brother's family had a lot to do with it. We're in and out of there a lot. And I'm sure the Allen family as well. And Peter Wright, when he came back after he moved up in the Koku area, more than likely came there as well to see the family. I think that was 1920. I haven't looked that up, but it was on the other video. Uh, so anyway, that home and the whole property was uh, on the brother's property and uh, right in the center of it. On the property as well, some say in that home, not exactly sure, the Allen Chapel was founded by um, Wright Brothers, his wife Mary, Balaam and Selena Allen, and Carrie, and a lot, of, a, lot, a lot of the things you pull down say Robert Lipscomb. The only Robert Lipscomb I see was the Robert Lipscomb that was born to Carrie and her husband Stephen, two years after the Allen Chapel. So I think someone earlier had misprinted that and uh, some people have just rolled with that. The Allen Chapel originally was on Lipscomb just on the north side of uh, University. Uh, in 19, I'm, I'm probably around 63 or maybe even before, the, the, the congregation got together and they built a new Allen Chapel which is in its present site for, closer to where I'm doing the video uh, and where the photos are uh, on Lipscomb and that was built in 1964 where it currently uh, is and uh, still serving the community. When a Wright Brothers passed away in 1910, uh, July 27, 1910, uh, he eventually was laid to rest in the Lyons Cemetery where his wife Mary is at his side. Carrie and Stephen Lipscomb were also in the same cemetery. Uh, but anyway, it's the Lyons Street Cemetery. But uh, his will is really interesting. I'm going to show it here. Maybe if you go to full screen, you can read it. But what I find interesting is that he left nothing to his children. But you got to remember back then, times were simple. If you had a roof over your head, you had a way to make some money, you were set for life. And whenever he said he was leaving nothing to his children, he put in there because they're situated in life. They're, they're comfortable and they're okay. But of course, his, Mary was uh, elderly and he had to make sure his wife was taken care of, so he left everything to her. So uh, I found it very sentimental, the way he worded that. And uh, I just found that a neat part of, of his will. And uh, hopefully you can read it on here. On a personal note, uh, I've been with UPS 30 years. In the first seven years of my career, starting in 87, uh, with South Crane Creek. Uh, one of the first folks I've met that I really admired and got along well with was uh, Willie Brothers, who was the grandson of Wright Brothers. And Willie, he was a former school teacher, World War II vet, uh, just a great guy. And uh, I would I'd stop about maybe once a week and talk to him in his garage, because you know we Floridians, we like to hang out in our garage. And he liked to do that as well. But he never talked about himself much, always about his dad, his grandfather, and of course his dad, William Rufus was the first African-American child born in the city of Melbourne. And uh, he's laid to rest in the Stone Cemetery. But the Willie, as he had me call him, uh, uh, was a good guy. And uh, he passed away in 90, 1995, and I knocked on the door. And uh, 
his wife uh, gave me permission to come to the funeral. It was during the work week, and I was going to be in my UPS uniform. And uh, I was honored to be able to go there and uh, to, his, to his services. And uh, that was at Allen Chapel. Anyway, we miss him. And he's laid to rest in Fountain Head Memorial Park in Palm Bay, just not far at all where my father was laid to rest uh, in the same, same place. As far as early education, uh, it really started with the Little Red Schoolhouse. It was down uh, south of Crane Creek off of Riverside Drive. Uh, it was a segregated school, even though whites and African Americans attended there, they attended at a different time. So anyway, uh, many pioneer kids went there. William Rufus Brothers would have attended school there. Balaam Allen Jr., uh, Fanny and Susie Allen probably attended school there. Probably some of the Lipscomb uh, kids. And of course, uh, many uh, white children from the pioneer families would have attended there as well. Well, eventually the Little Red Schoolhouse was insufficient, just not big enough as Melbourne was growing. So the African American community built a one-room schoolhouse. I believe it had two seats, two rows of chairs on the corner of W.H. Jackson, formerly Line Street in Lipscomb. Uh, the church sits there all around the corner today, right on the location where the school was. John Wesley Brothers would have attended school there, uh, Elizabeth Brothers, and uh, uh, Marie Lipscomb probably would have attended school there, and, and others. But uh, that, uh, that was there for a number of years. In 1921, they built the Melbourne Vocational School. And uh, that served many, many people. Many folks in the community went to school there. Uh, James Ryland Jr. Uh, went to school there. He was the uh, North Area Superintendent of Schools, and uh, which at the time, he was the highest African American uh, in the school system in Brevard County history. Uh, everyone say, from what I've read, and heard about him. Uh, he died of cancer at a young age and had that not happened he was without question would have been the superintendent of schools. Uh, he was admired uh, by a lot of people. Uh, Peggy Jewel Jefferson went to school there. Her mom Lily Mae Tatum Brothers she uh, she taught there. Uh, her and uh, her husband are buried up at uh, the Melbourne Cemetery and Peggy uh, she's buried at uh, Stone uh, Cemetery. But, uh, the school burnt down in 1953 for a while they went up to the Naval Air Station and went to school as Stone Middle School was being built. And of course that serves the community today. Uh, after it was burnt down, the city wanted to put uh, apartments on the site of the vocational school, a former vocational school. Um, Harry Lawrence, again with uh, other members of the Civic League, fought that and said, we really need a park here. So uh, they convinced the city council to put a park there and they named it in honor of um, Wright Brothers and uh, the park is very much in use. But just around the corner takes me to Spain's Bar. Uh, this was built in 1946 and it was really a focal point of the community in the 50s and 60s. Uh, that's where folks would go out with their girlfriend or wife and uh, have a good time drinking, dancing, uh, dinner, uh, just socializing with uh, the community. Uh, if you're from out of town you can stay upstairs. But uh, you know, it, it kind of got a bad rap at the end, but a lot of it was what was going on around it, not as much as what was inside it. Uh, I remember the uh, former owner, I think it might have been Charles Statham, had a license put on the front that said, Spain's Bar, a touch of class. And that's how I want to remember, not, not in this latter, latter years, but, but what it was built for and how it did serve the community at a time as a touch of class. There used to be a Phillips 66 here, just south of Spain's Bar. Anyone knows who owns it? Post below, let me know. Uh, they had a sign out front. I always wanted to get it, but uh, now the building's gone and the sign's gone. So, anyway, I don't know who owned that store and that gas station, but I'm sure it served the entire community. Well, just for the record, you might notice I've got a different shirt on about four or five times in this video. Uh, I came down with a flu when I started doing this, and uh, I really have been kind of laboring a little bit. But also, I like to do the narrating and stuff as I'm doing the video. And it has been incredibly windy, so I haven't been able to do that out there and talk. So I did it all in my house, and uh, like I said, the flu hasn't made it any easier, but uh, we're getting through it. Well, I'm coming back around kind of where we started. If you look at the palms, palm trees by this house, this was the house that Harry Lawrence lived in in his last days. And he's buried at the Stone Cemetery. But I'm going to talk more about him in another video. I'm going to do a whole video based on him. But folks that come up on the north side before you make the turn, Take a look at all those palms that are in the back here up along the south side of Crane Creek. He hand planted all of those. He was a landscaper. And again, I'm not going to talk about him too much, but maybe a tip of the hat would be good for what he did with this community, maybe more than anyone else. 
Obviously, he had help, but a uh, very influential, very uh, great man. 50s and 60s, Terry Lawrence was the man. But one thing he was the man about also was getting the first black police officer hired, and uh, James Rowland. The story I heard was uh, they've been talking about it in the council meetings, and uh, this was the meeting they were going to decide on it, and they did. And uh, Harry Lawrence had James Rowland outside, and as soon as they approved him, he ran and grabbed and brought him in and said, Here's your man. So, uh, from what I understand, he borrowed Harry Lawrence's gun when he first got hired, and they did not uh, furnish him a handgun, so he used Harry Lawrence's. But he lived right here. Now there's this hole that he fed his, his last days out, Mr. Ryle, when that is. Uh, he worked for Harry Lawrence sometimes as well. Uh, towards his days of retiring, he retired in the police force in 67. He uh, built this place where I was grocery right next door. And uh, it's a place that he worked uh, much of the time, whenever he was retired. Uh, the story I have about this place that I remember when I was working uh, in UPS in this area, there was a gentleman named uh, Teddy Bell, his real name was Oscar Bell, he was always working in here. And uh, he never let me come in and make a delivery without going out with something to drink that he would never let me pay for. And I often wondered how many kids came in here with their parents that maybe they didn't have the money or they didn't deserve something that he probably made them go out with, with a, a piece of candy or something. I bet he did that for his time. Teddy was a good guy, a really good guy. Uh, benches out front is uh, where a lot of the old timers just sit around and talk. And, and uh, I recognize a lot of folks that come by here that sit out here and talk a lot. There's something in here that I want to show you. Yeah, right over here. This is what I want to show you. There's his belt. And right here at the Melbourne Cemetery, just off the tracks in the back of the cemetery, we will find Melbourne's first African American police officer's resting place. Hey, I don't know about you, but I think it's time to put some type of a memorial and marker of what this man accomplished uh, for the city of Melbourne and the African American community. Uh, this looks like a great spot for it, don't you think? This here 2905 Lipscomb Street, this uh, is obviously a brand new home. It's built right on top of the former home of James and Inez Thayer. And James Thayer was one of the early black police officers and uh, James Ryle would have been one of his mentors, obviously, probably his mentor. But they used to live on this site uh, before this home was built. She was a nice lady. Never met him, but she was a nice lady. Heading down to us one. Uh, Tucker's Plumbing. Tucker's Plumbing was a great place I used to deliver here. Uh, Leon Tucker was a businessman, good businessman, kept things in order. But the crew he had here, they liked to cut up. They liked to have a good time. So he told me to get straightened up and get back to work. But uh, the guy I remember the most when I was coming here back in the late 80s was, his name was Dickie. I don't remember his last name. He wrote all me all the checks and stuff, so I usually had to deal with Dickie. He always had a stub cigar in the corner of his mouth. For one day I asked him, I said, I said, Dickie, is that the same cigar you had yesterday? And I knew it was, I just was jokingly saying that. And he just chuckled. And for about the next five years, I'd ask him that every time I went in there, and he would just chuckle. He never, ever did answer me. Always got a kick out of that. Brooks Flaps is another uh, enjoyable place to go to. Uh, I remember a guy named Steve Gates kind of ran it. Uh, and his dad, I think, uh, uh, his dad did, uh, did run it. I'm assuming his dad was the owner, I'm not exactly sure. And Steve was a funny character, but his dad, I want to say the name was Charlie, I could be wrong. His dad was a real cut up. I mean, he was hilarious, and I always had a good time going in there. Uh, farmers refinishing uh, furniture. Uh, Richard Farmer was a, a nice guy. I loved talking to him, good conversations with him. And he was an artist. Man. I, I looked at the furniture and, and what I would see one day and come back a couple weeks later and what I would see. Uh, he, was a, he was an artist, that's all I can say. He was really good at what he did. And his son, Richard Farmer, uh, Jr., I was got along really well with him. I reached out far and said, Richard, Rich on the side. I always knew he was coming. But anyway, uh, good guys, good people in there. I always enjoyed Farmers. Jackson's, Jackson's Electric. 
Uh, never saw Mr. Jackson too much because he was a busy guy. He's got a lot of a lot of a lot of things going on. I'm sure checking on a lot of jobs. Never saw him too much. But Tammy's daughter was always working in there when I would go in there. And uh, she was pretty pretty young at that time. A nice nice young lady. Good conversations with her. Uh, so I will drive by Jackson's lunch today and think. I think on social media back then they have now. I'm not sure how much job how much work Tammy would have gotten done. I'm kind of kidding, but. Uh, Tammy likes to, uh, she likes to hold conversations, let's just put it that way. And if you know her, you know that's true. But a nice, nice lady then, I know she's a nice lady now. And I uh, miss those conversations, but I always laugh at myself when I think about that when I drive by there. And right next to it there, maybe my favorite place, I'm there all my favorite, but Rosie Beauty Salon. Love the one in the Rosie Tillman. If you know Rosie Tillman, she's a blessing to you. I don't have to say anything else about it. She's one of my favorite people I've ever met in my 30 years there. And uh, just, just enjoy talking to her, but I really didn't know what was going on in the community. Just listen to the ladies that were there getting their hair done. And so I always had a, got a kick out of going in there. I was thinking about Rosie. She was a good business lady. She knew where every penny was going, everywhere where every penny came from. She really knew what she was doing. She had a funny way about paying me. And back then, we used to take cash, and most of the hair salons were cash only, not because of that particular salon, but because there's so many fly by night people. If you're in the business, you know what I'm talking about. So they just made everything cash. Uh, and so I would go in there with a COD for maybe $70 or 50 cents, and Rosie would open up her drawer, she'd pull out with 50 cents and maybe a $10, and she'd make Betty get up and get her hair dried, and pull 20 bucks out of the bottom of the seat, and uh, then she would open up her drawer with her utensils with it to do the hair, she'd pull out another 20, then she'd make me turn around, and then she'd present another 20, I don't know where that came from. She'd open up her Bible and look to Exodus, and there'd be the rest of the money. That's, what, that's how Rosie did it. If you renovate that, renovate that whole place today, you'd probably find some money. But uh, anyway, I got a kick out of the way she did that. But, uh, but she didn't know what she was doing business-wise. But what a blessing that lady was. I know she's a blessing to a ton of people in the community. And uh, I see her once in a while. Uh, on down here, way before my time, was Lindsay Lumber. The only reason I'm putting this on here about 15 years ago, I saw the power wash in the back, and I saw the name revealed. Why I've waited 15 years to put it anywhere out, I don't know why, but I did. So there it is. So anyway, that's that. Well, I'm standing here in Stone Cemetery. Uh, Brothers Park is right behind me in the background, as you can probably see. Um, lots more history here, but I uh, hope you enjoyed this little brief walk through uh, South Crane Creek. Uh, lots more to do. I've got a couple more videos right in the same area I'm working on. So, uh, hey, if you are a descendant of the Stone family, John Stone, uh, post something below, either on the History of Memories of Brevard County, the Facebook page, or this YouTube page, and I'd like to get with you, and I'm trying to do a video on him. Uh, also, I've got one coming up on Harry Lawrence that uh, I'm really looking forward to getting done, and uh, that should be a good one, too. Lots of history there, and... Uh, We'll be back to this cemetery in my next video. There's a, a lot to talk about here. I'm going to save that for the next time, but I thought it would be a, a fitting place to end this video anyway. So thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.